Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Effective RCM Starts at the Digital Front Door. My name is Brian Zimmerman, and I'm pleased to serve as your moderator today. On behalf of Becker Healthcare, thank you so much for joining us. Before we get going here, I'm just going to walk through a few quick housekeeping instructions. So we will have a panel discussion for today's webinar, and we certainly welcome any comments or questions you may have. You can submit those throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. Today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link you used to log into today's webinar to access that recording. If at any time you have trouble with your, your audio or video, please try refreshing your browser. You can also submit any technical questions into the Q&A box, and we've got folks on the back end who can assist with that. So with that, I, I want to move to introductions now for this outstanding group we've put together for, for this, this talk. I'm going to tap on each of these folks to introduce themselves, share a bit about their professional background organization, and then we'll move into the discussion. Um, Jeff, let's begin with you. Hi, I'm Jeffrey Flynn from Gramercy Surgery Center in New York City. We uh, formed Gramercy over 20 years ago. Uh, we have two surgery centers here, and I'm also vice president of the New York State Association of Ambulatory Surgery Centers. Excellent. Thank you for being here, Jeffrey. Andrew, go ahead. My name is Andrew Lovewell. I'm the Chief Executive Officer at Columbia Orthopedic Group. Uh, we're a private practice in Columbia, Missouri, uh, with about 30 physicians, uh, ASC, and all the other ancillaries that come along with it. Excellent. Great to have you here, Andrew. John, go ahead. Hi, I'm John Brady. I'm the CEO of Fox Valley Orthopedics in uh, Geneva, Illinois, the western suburbs of Chicago. Uh, we are we have 10 offices, an ambulatory surgery center, a full line of imaging, uh, 25 doctors, and um, we are proudly celebrating our 50th year in, as an independent, uh, fiercely independent orthopedic practice. Congrats on that, John, and, and thank you for being here as well. Brian, let's finish up with you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Brian Doyle, Senior Vice President of Enterprise and Technology Partnerships at Rectangle Health. Uh, Rectangle Health is a leading healthcare patient payment and engagement platform. Uh, we work with private practices like these great gentlemen here uh, to streamline cash flow, improve EBITDA, uh, faster access to cash, and streamline staff workflows. Excellent. Well, thank you, Brian, for being here, and thank you, everyone, for for those intros. Let's let's dive in here, and we'll we'll begin by talking about the rise of consumerism in healthcare, which, of course, we've been talking about for some time now. Curious to get some some opinions on on where folks think the industry st stands now in terms of this evolution towards consumerism, and what benefits and or challenges has this trend really created for ASCs? For Brian, I'm actually going to start with you here, just because as, as you mentioned, you work with a lot of different folks across across the, the nation. So I think you have a really interesting high level view of this. So if you could kick things off by sharing your take. Yeah, abs absolutely. So, you know, I've been in this industry for about 14 years um, and I'm on the business side, the, the consumer side. Uh, so I'm not on the clinical side, but we saw this trend start right around COVID, right? Text to pay had to come out, digital forms had to happen, things like that. But what we've seen is an absolute explosion over the last two years of how do we access everything through our cell phones as consumers? Um, I I use analogies quite a bit. I think about making a dinner reservation. You know, you used to call, they used to write your name down, you go, they have the big book, they find you, they seat you. Well, that's how healthcare used to work too. Now I can go on websites, I can make an appointment, I can interact with the staff via uh, two-way text. These are commonplace today. And what we're seeing on our end, on the tech side, is patients are shopping their experience based off of this. And that's the big turning point. Um, patient loyalty, patient experience matters. So we have to meet the patient where they are, uh, which might mean we have to pull the tech up faster than maybe our staff wants to in some cases. But that's the big turning point over the past, I would say 12 to 24 months, is the patients are saying, I need this technology, otherwise I'm gonna go next door where it's just easier to interact. So ease of use, ease of appointment, ease of pay, uh, all of that matters to the consumers today. Yeah, and a quick follow up there for you, for you, Brian. I mean, you mentioned you're not on the the clinical side of things, but I, I also imagine it's sort of, um, it, it, and maybe I might be off here, but I imagine when a patient is engaging with uh, an organization that way, if they have a sophisticated or clean tech platform, 
probably gives folks a lot of confidence in that organization. Would you say that's that's fair? Fair take. That's absolutely right. There's actually a lot of data out there around ease to, ease of paying, uh, which actually improves your patient loyalty. So said differently, if I can pay without having to write a check or get a physical piece of paper or a paper statement, which we all dislike, um, my actual my patient loyalty actually goes up. So there's a direct correlation between ease of payment and patient loyalty in healthcare. So it's actually fascinating, the stats that are out there now. Appreciate it, Brian. Uh, appreciate you setting the stage for, for this, this conversation to come. John, going to you now with this question in terms of where you think sort of healthcare is in, in this consumerism journey and how it's affected ASCs. Well, 20, 30 years ago, I called patients customers in a meeting with a cardiovascular surgeon and almost lost my job, uh, you know, referring to a patient as a customer. Today, consumers, you know, consumerism is very big, as Brian just outlined, for all the reasons Brian just outlined. But what's interesting about consumerism that we need to think about is consumerism is about meeting is wants and needs. Consumers want something. We have what they need, but we may not necessarily have what they want. So how do we can how do we match those wants and those needs? Because, you know, I want a lot of things in life. I don't need a lot of things in life. So how do we take those wants, translate them into the needs and satisfy the expectation of the patient, customer, whatever you want to call them, along the way? Um, it's, it's a very difficult balancing act. Brian very uh, eloquently articulated a lot of it in that it's, you know, ease. Um, it's all everybody wants an easy button. Everybody wants things to be simple. Um, our practices, you know, the front desk and all those folks, they need to look like the duck sliding across the pond. We're behind the scenes. All the stuff is going, you know, paddling away to make sure it's easy. A patient is not, I had, I was at a patient satisfaction meeting once a long time ago. And the person from the patient satisfaction firm says that patients don't give us permission to do them harm. So they also don't give us permission to frustrate them. Uh, they already are in a compromised position when they come to an orthopedic practice. They've, they have an injury. They have something wrong with them. They don't need the frustration of, of uh, a challenging website or a difficult um, RCM system or, you know, a, a registration system and things like that. They, they, need, they need easy and they need simple. So we need to align what they need with what they say they want and what, what we need. The other, th other part of this is our physicians are also our customers. There's also consumerism in their respect for AC. Our AC, ASC is independently owned and only allowed, only allows our partners. But when we're trying to make, when we're trying to get referrals from other physicians and the other practices in the area, because we're independent, we don't have a feeder system, natural academic feeder system like everybody else. We have to make sure that we're able to meet the needs of their patients. So we don't want their patients getting mad because we're so hard to work our way through. Yeah. And, and conceptually, the that alignment between wants and needs, I, I think, makes a lot of sense. But I'm wondering if we can get even a, a little more tactical here, John. Like, what, what does that work actually look like? How do you figure out what that alignment is? Well, that's going to cost you now. Uh, the... Uh, <laughs> You know, it's it's listening to the voice of the customer. I mean, these are I'm throwing out a lot of jargon with that type of stuff, but it 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 works. You listen to what the customer tells you, and you you know, uh, the there's a foul. I mean, yes, see, more senior patients do have a little bit more difficulty with technology, but there's a fallacy that more senior patients can't use technology. My mother is 91. Uh, she has an iPad. And she emails and texts me and FaceTimes me all the time. Um, and uh, so they, they are a little more acquainted with it than, than they're given credit for. Um, so tactically, we just have to make it as simple as possible. Um, the text alerts, the links in the text alerts, the, the things like that that take them right to where they need to be. Don't ask them tricky questions. You know, ask them simple questions. To, you know, lay out the expectations clearly up front. Your appointment is at 9 a.m. tomorrow with Dr. Smith. You will have a $25 copay that you will be asked to remit at the time of service, or would you like to remit that now? And give them an easy way to do it. Um, you know, so that's that's the, don't be so dogmatic in that we don't take checks anymore. You know, stuff like that. Be open and flexible to align with that, but listen to what they're asking for. 
be flexible, but also be there, keep things as simple as possible. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, it's easy to, to, to think about an older person maybe being able to respond directly to a text message, but I don't think anybody wants to sit and fill out a whole bunch of forms on a, on a clunky website. I don't think that's anybody's idea of a good time, regardless of age. Um, Jeffrey, Andrew, I want to get to you too, but Brian, I saw yourself come, come off mute. I, I think you got a hook on here. Yeah, he, John, John got me. So John's spot on, right? Th this demographic age, we hear it a lot. There is no data that supports that demographics will change the use of technology in healthcare. Um, there's actually the opposite of that. Uh, we found text to pay, things like text to pay, things, anything with a mobile phone, the open rates are the same. The usage rates are the same across the board. 18 to 24, 24 to 30, 30 to 50, 50 plus. Um, like John said, my parents use iPhones and iPads all the time. Um, that is how the world is going. So that, that John, John nailed it. Uh, so I just wanted to make chime in that the stats back that up as well. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. Jeffrey, let's get you your take now. I think part of the consumerism too, and especially as it, it relates to the ASCs coming down, also has to be on the thing of cost. Um, we're seeing a lot of employer direct uh, situations. I think most people in America don't realize that 70% of the insured people are actually insured through self-insured funds through companies. And they're not recognizing that a lot of the large companies, they might have a United Healthcare or Blue Cross Blue Shield insurance card or something, but it's actually a self-funded group. Similar, like traditionally, it's always been with unions. And what we're seeing is that a number of companies are coming together and looking for cost savings. The way they can do this is they can go to the consumer and say, you have a $2,000 deductible, you have a 20% copay, and you know, depending if we just say a $5,000 surgery, if that situation's in that thing, most Americans today, unfortunately, cannot meet that expense. So these companies directly exist to bring the cost down. If, if it was in a hospital, for instance, and this is where surgery centers benefit, the cost is probably gonna be double to um, 70, 175 really. So if we take a case where a consumer direct, and we're starting to see this drive, and there's a number of companies that are doing this, but they're taking motion, they're going to larger companies and saying, if you go this route, there'll be no out-of-pocket costs for the patient. And that we're seeing that to be a very quick rise, and it's a brand new business out there, but it's really starting to take hold. I, I want to say that um, statistically, I think there was probably about 25,000 surgeries done like this last year. They expect there to be 125,000 surgeries this year and close to half a million you know, by next year. So we're looking at that from a standpoint where the consumerism comes down to it's actually affordability for the cases. We're being given lower costs driving to us because we are the more efficient, lower cost situation. I think also a patient experience. So if the patient has the ability to come in and know that they're, there's not gonna be a, fine, a heavy financial burden and they're coming in and we're able to just present a better patient experience really because we're not we're dealing with we're not dealing with eminent care we're scheduled care if we run our centers efficiently and we run everything going forward through there's not going to be a three or four hour delay like there may be in a hospital when an anesthesiologist is pulled out so that whole experience is there but we're going to see more and more of this consumerism as we go forward because people are seeing just it's the only way to bring healthcare costs down and it's actually the businesses that are going to create these and seeking out these companies to reduce their their actual cost, since so many of them are self-funded. And, and Jeffrey, what kind of adjustments are is that going to require of, of ASCs? I guess uh, it's a the ASC has to coordinate and do everything because it's not just going to be the ASC. You're creating a bundle itself, so therefore you have to have anesthesia, you have to have the surgeon on board. You have to have the designated lab set up for them. And so there's a lot of legwork on the ASC's part, but once that actually occurs and the first few experiences happen, the companies that are doing this are looking for the least, um, they're looking for the best experience with the least resistance. So the more a surgery center makes themselves adapt to that, that they, 
this is a great hand surgeon. This is a great knee surgeon. We're, we're going to get these in here. They're going to see the patient within such and such time. You're really getting involved into the schedule. So they're actually getting a real concierge service. And the, the quarterback of that concierge service is, tech, is really the surgery center. It's hard when it, it can be the practice if the practice owns the surgery center, but really has to be because you need to be able to control the main, the main event. Yeah, it's a lot of coordination happening here. That it sounds like ASCs really need to lean into. Uh, thank you, thank you, Jeffrey. Andrew, you've been waiting patiently here. I, I want to advance the conversation, but I also want to make sure to give you some space here to, to, to uh, hook on any additional comments around this consumerism piece and what you're seeing. Yeah, I think everybody, you know, before me said it right. You know, if you if you're gonna kind of dumb it down, it's the kiss method, right? Keep it simple, stupid. Just make it easy for people to come see you. Don't create friction and it all work out. Very succinctly put, Andrew, appreciate it. Uh, I wanna advance that and I'll give you first crack at, at this question. I think based on some of the, the comments from, from, from the other panelists, I think we've got a decent sort of picture of what a, a, a good patient experience looks like here. It's simple, it's sort of intuitive, um, easy to use. But I guess what's standing in the way of, of achieving this sort of the, this, you know, excellent modern patient financial experience? What's getting in the way of this? What are the biggest challenges you've encountered and, and how have you overcome these challenges? Um, again, Andrew, you get first crack at this. Yeah, I think some of the challenges come from, you know, the technology we have today, a lot of our practices, at least I know we're plagued by this, is we bought EHRs and PMs a while ago that don't necessarily work as seamlessly. Every tech solution says it's seamless, right? There's no such thing. Um, it doesn't work seamlessly with our interoperability internally today. So it creates more internal strife and work. Somebody mentioned, you know, you got to be the, the duck uh, at the front desk. I think John said that. That's kind of our business offices, right? Is they get punished on the back end by more of these tech solutions we bring in because some of them just don't work integrated in an in environment like we're used to today. And on top of that, I think what we find with patients today is the propensity to pay and shop around for things is just gonna continue to increase. That's our first topic, right? The consumerism piece of it. So by not having the tech, um, like most of us, uh, we're part of a big uh, consortium called the Ortho Forum. Um, I think John's group is in it as well. Most of our large private 100, top 100 private practice groups in the country, we don't have digital front doors for patients to schedule appointments, make payments, do all those things. Um, just because it hasn't been placed as a priority, unfortunately. And I think some of it is kind of a scarcity mentality where we're afraid if we add that on, then all of a sudden, like that's going to cost money and then what's going to happen with margin and it's chicken and egg, right? Like if you don't do this, you lose margin. You have to do it to keep margin and make margin. So that that's kind of my two cents on it. Now, I think others may agree, disagree, but. And, and, and then Andrew specifically, how do you, I guess, navigate that tension between the, the sort of like chicken egg conversation? How do you, how do you make those decisions, make those calls in terms of what's right for the practice? I think you just do the right thing. Whatever the right thing is, it, it's going to, it's going to be, the light's going to get shown on it and you just do it. And it, it costs money today, but it's going to pay off in spades down the road. So you've got to invest in the practice and the technology and your people, give them the tools they need to take care of patients coming in the door. Because without patients, none of this really matters. And, and if we're not putting up or standing up platforms to make that possible, it it's all for nothing. So my philosophy is just, let's just do the right thing. We have to do it. Might as well just do it now and get it over with so we can get the suffering over yeah. And, and the right thing is something that, you, like, you know, you're keeping the patient in mind in terms of what the right thing is. Um, John, let's hear from you now. Uh, I I agree with a lot of what Andrew was saying there. We actually just did change our electronic record system last year. Um, and while it's been, a, you know, it's, it's really added a lot for us, it, it gave us that digital front door, which is nice. It gave us, you know, that ability for credit card payment and, you know, and, and some online scheduling, which we're just really a year into it starting to leverage, which we're having some success with. 
Um, you know, we use an external company, I think we all know them, uh, that, you know, identifies new patients. And just doing that helped boost our portal usage. So that was big. Um, but, you know, what gets in the way of a lot of this stuff is the uh, prior auth. Uh, the insurance companies, the rules around prior auth, the ever-changing um, uh, landscape, uh, you know, insurance companies and what they reimburse for various buy and build drugs, um, things like that. I mean, having to be on top of that stuff, you know, you could lose your shirt if you're not actively paying attention to it. And the prior auth rules are just ridiculous. I mean, you talk about consumerism, you know, and it's like, uh, you know, if you, if you, if you go to Applebee's, you don't expect to be asked if, uh, you know, if, if you have permission to eat there today. Um, and that's kind of what we face a little bit, not that we're Applebee's. I mean, I would put us way above Olive Garden, but, um, you know, the the thing that, the, the, just that whole, I get the prior auth, I get why it's necessary, but why make it so difficult? I mean, it's not like we do a whole lot of different things. I mean, an orthopedic practice does these things. You know, why can't we negotiate in some of that that's automatically prior authorized? You know, let's put the clinical judgment back in the hand of the provider and get it away from the $18 an hour person, you know, sitting in a phone center in Atlanta or Chicago that has just been trained to say no. We have to get away from that. And, and that's, to me, the biggest issue in a lot of this stuff. And, you know, the Applebee's of ASCs is a headline you'll never see at Becker's. And, and, and if you do, let me know and I will. I will take issue with someone, <laughs> but John, thank you so much for, for your comments there. Yeah, Jeffrey, I, what do you, go ahead. Go I ahead, think, um, you know, to Andrew's point, it was really, is changing technology. Like the first, I'm now in my third EMR system and it was just the necessity as time went on, what was available back in 2006 and 2007 versus what was available in 2014 and 15 to versus what was available in 2020. And to get that better technology and get get to be able to make it easier for the patients to set up systems where we can confirm with the patient via text getting their permission. We can um, send messages through the system directly now. So people don't have to, um, and it, and it faces right up to a patient tracker. So if an escort doesn't want to stay there and wants to leave, um, which is kind of, I think it's the trends wherever you are. In New York City, very often escorts drop them off and then they come back and get them afterwards. But in that trend, to be able to text that person and say they're going to be ready in 20 minutes and the person's there in 20 minutes to take them, that's a real relief to them as opposed to them sitting there for two hours, depending how long the surgery is, and sitting back and forth with that. There is one thing that we did in specific, and you wouldn't be able to do it in orthopedics, but um, we're multi-specialty. We ended up doing it just straight for cataracts because it was just, uh, it's one code, it's one straightforward thing. Um, we actually employed a bot to get the pre-auth. So that, that suddenly became for us, we were getting about 94%. So we went back to the other 6% to ones we have problems with, but like actually getting the authorization, we got it through the bot. And so it was amazing to actually do that. So that was something we did kind of through one particular company and it actually has worked out for us because that also cut down um, a tremendous situation on my workflow um, because just, I mean, I do about 10,000 cases a year, but probably 4,000 of those are cataracts. So just to be able to cut that down with pre-authorization, I mean, Dumbing it down to that, I would say more like 1,500 of them would have required some kind of pre-authorization because of the managed Medicaid or the managed Medicare. So that really did help us a lot. Yeah. Thank you, Jeffrey. John, it looks yeah. like you got a hook on and then- we'll Yeah, if I can add on that. You know, th this is where the wants and needs consumerism and the reality of the litigious and rule heavy world of healthcare kind of collide. You know, we're not just competing with the efficiency and the pass-through of other healthcare providers. You know, we're, we're competing with everybody. I mean, in my neighborhood, they just opened a Chipotle with a Chipotle lane. 
which means you can order on the app, drive through, you don't even have to go in. You know, so the consumer expectation of, you know, this TikTok generation is starting to really, really, the attention span is starting to really, really get smaller. And it's true not just demographically, it's across everything. So we're competing with this expectation of service, of immediate service, you know, and immediate instant gratification that is really challenging to explain when a patient's a little energized or a little agitated because they're in pain. And that's, that's, a, that's a big problem. And, and, you know, I don't know if anyone else has noticed it, but people don't, aren't as nice as they used to be when it comes to stuff like that. They, they want it when they want it. If I want it tomorrow, I'll wait to ask, you know, and no, we need to, so we need to find ways to manage that. And that's where wants and needs come into it and all that. So I, 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 I appreciate what Jeff was saying there because it may, really makes that, that, that expectations tying to wants and needs really, really well. Yeah, I appreciate that, John. And it's, it stands to reason, too, if people are getting this very convenient experience elsewhere in their lives, where would they not want it more than with their health care? Um, if they can get it for dinner, like, why wouldn't you want it for, for your health care, as you say, when folks are in pain? Um, Brian, it's been a while since we checked in with you here, so I want to get your take on sort of what you've heard so far, and then I'll, I'll, I'll pose a different question to you. Yeah, I did. To be brief, it change management's critical, right? Change management's the number one barrier we see on our end, obviously, um, because there has to be institutional buy-in, and then the users have to buy into what the problem is we're trying to solve. So, well, at any time you know we're talking or in a conference or on a panel, it's what is the, what is the issue, what defines success, and what steps are we taking to get there? So, if our issue is show rates or our issue is post-adjudication billing, well, how can we fix that issue and what defines success? So change management is always the number one barrier when we have these types of conversations. So you have to find the right partner, you have to right, find the right vendor, you, you have to have C-level buy-in to the process. Uh, otherwise the users don't really take on to the new software uh, the way they should. And, and Brian, you talked there about sort of show rates, and we haven't we haven't discussed that a ton yet so far in this conversation. Can you talk a little bit about because I, I don't think patients necessarily realize that those those missed appointments um, are, are ultimately costly for for yeah. organizations. I don't think that's something they're they're necessarily aware of. So, can you talk a little bit about what you've seen in terms of how some of your partners have maybe worked to 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 address that challenge? Absolutely, yeah. So show rates are. I, Mission critical, right? Get the patients through the door. That That is the hard part. Um, we have this big base of patients or consumers uh, in our EMR, EHRs. How do we get them back? How do we recall them? How do we market to them about the new things that are happening? Maybe we have financing platforms now. Maybe we do payment plans, whatever it might be. But how do we increase show rate um, is one of the biggest things we're constantly thinking about um, on our end. So a 1% increase in show rate times your average um, procedure is a lot of money to an organization, especially private organizations, specifically private organizations, actually. Uh, so the education around why uh, appointments are so important to the patient needs to happen. We need to have a number tied to each appointment. Then we need the technology because banging the phones it, like the old days, that's really not the best route anymore. So we need an automated system to go out and get it. So the biggest thing we're seeing to improve show rates is wait list management. Meaning there's systems out there now where if I cancel my appointment for 3.30, I, the next 25 in line are gonna get a text. And then the next 25 until someone accepts that appointment. And it, the most important thing about that, it should be a like for like appointment. Not all appointments are the same. Um, a checkup isn't as valuable as an MRI and a surgery, right? Or whatever it might be. So we want to make sure we stack the schedule for like for like um, procedures. So show rate, uh, show rate using waitlist management and patient self-scheduling self is catching on. Um, I believe that's the next iteration of this personally. Um, I like scheduling for myself as opposed to going through a back and forth. And, and what do you think is necessarily going to, in terms of patient self-scheduling, What's going to, I guess, move the needle, so to speak, to where that does become the sort of the reality? Yeah, that's on the clinical side. A lot of doctors block their calendars off or don't have the time or don't want to take that um, 
take that patient at a certain time. So that is actually more of the um, the roadblock we're seeing right now is on the physician side. Uh, but I do believe patients will continue to push for this because that is what they're looking for too. To John's point, I want to know, I have an appointment tomorrow at 11.45, not 12, not 11.30, 11.45. And I want to be able to book that appointment. Yep, yep. Thank you, Brian. Andrew, come to you now and, and sort of talk about how you approach, you know, show rates, uh, reducing no shows, that sort of thing. Yeah, I think Brian's spot on, you know, 1% in no show rate it it's a big deal you know it turns into two to three percent on a balance sheet all of a sudden or on an income statement so you know the way we approach it is um we're pretty aggressive with reminders and texts and everything we don't have online scheduling yet that's our next kind of wave or iteration that we're putting in um is bringing that to market and no one in our market actually has it except for every freaking dentist on every corner so it seems like everything they've done for four or five years, we're finally all kind of catching up to going, huh, okay. They figured it, it must, out. They must have listened to my last panel, Andrew. That makes <laughs> maybe, sense. Maybe. So they, they figured it out. But like we're trying, I mean, it's just consumerism friendly. So like you have to make it to where it's not onerous for no-shows, like not a huge massive fee for a no-show rate or something like that. But also you got to be wise enough to backload, you know, those people canceling and not showing. And I think that that's where organizations can really win out is managing that wait list. We also created um, just same day slots where people can just call up and be seen without any of the hassle, you know, and we're getting ready to open a uh, walk in clinic as well. Or if anybody wants to just walk in off the street, you know, we'll see you immediately. It doesn't matter what your payer is um, because from the kind of opening the top of the funnel mentality, just get them in here, kind of get them in the submarine, shut the lid and let's go. Because once they're in the door, they're never leaving. Um, that's it. That's how our market is. Brand loyalty is very, very high here. You just, you got to get them in. So that's how we address it, Brian. Appreciate that, Andrew. Uh, John, Jeffrey, any, any, any additional information in terms of how you approach it? Any, uh, are you sort of aligned with what Andrew's doing? Anything unique? Maybe John go first and then Jeffrey will hear from you. Um, so the way I look at it is the only product that we have to sell is time. That's, that's all we have. And it is a limited commodity. Now, how we create value in that time, that's the expertise of the clinical providers. That's the care that's being provided, the things that are happening. But if we miss that time, we're not getting it back. So we have to find ways to, um, <clears throat> as, as Brian said, uh, you know, reduce those no-show rates, have that cue and call people. I mean, who doesn't want to get called to say that appointment you have in 60 days, I can get you in next week. You know, people want that. Uh, it, it's, it's, you kind of like won a lottery there, you know, that you got in earlier and you feel special. So uh, at least I do. Um, so, um, it's a, it's a really important thing. I mean, and to the point about, you know, a 1% increase, I'm reminded of Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Tipping Point, where he talked about, you know, big change doesn't happen in big, bold moments. Big change happens at the margins. You want to start really making things happen. You start fixing the little things, and then they'll snowball and, and, and go on and on and on. So that's how I look at it, and that's, how I, that's what I'm trying to instill culturally in our front desk and care team coordinators and, and operations management folks. And quickly, before we get to you, Jeffrey, how do you instill that? How, how do you create that culture and, and get that, that buy-in? Here. <laughs> no. um, <laughs> basically, uh, basically, no, I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, basically, okay. I'm, a, I'm an academic at heart. If you can't tell this by listening to me for five minutes, I, I teach at Loyola University. And the, I'm a big fan of models. I'm a big fan of, of systems thinking and things like that. And when we talk about um, change management, change management is really team building. Uh, team building is a really strong element of change management. If you think about Tuckman's model of um, forming, storming, norming, and performing, you, you have to get people on the same page to come together as a group. You got to let them push back on you in the storming thing. And then once you get them and you, when you start to see them start to standardize it and make it work, that's where it gets enculturated. And then start messaging around, you know, reward. That's what moves them from the normal, you know, standardization to the actual performing and strong efficiency. 
it's not something you can do in a week. It takes months, years, um, but it's 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 a slow cycle of change management. Anything you're doing in healthcare is turning a cruise ship, and you got to kind of look at it that way and just be be prepared to to play the long game and get that done. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing those those details there. And you, you had me for a minute when, when you said fear. I was uh, <laughs> so I was like, well, where do I where do I take this conversation now? Um, but uh, thank you, John. Um, Jeffrey, go ahead. I think with us, we were a unique situation when we started, and, and it really could only work in New York because we have an oversaturation of doctors here. So when you're seeking out doctors to own in a center or start a center, you there's there's a whole nother crowd that never will be able to own in a center. But they do have cases and they were looking for an experience. There's a shortage of ORs and we knew that going into it. So we kind of set up a customer base to try to get to know who our customer was. So to find the patterns with them, but even there's one thing we finally dove in and thought it was a big expense, but it has cut down on our cancellation to begin with. We have a, a patient care team that actually seeks out the medical clearances for them. They, they jump beyond the, the individual doctor's office. You know, that scheduler in that office has other things to do. She's scheduling people for office visits, everything else, the surgery part itself, and we kind of noticed this with the hospitals, it was always kind of a, an adversarial role. You know, we sent this to you. No, you didn't send it to us. And it. so what we decided to do is like, we took the attitude, you know, if there is a mess up with the patient, just let us know and we'll take the blame for it. Don't worry about that. But getting the specific things that we didn't have same day cancellation or day before cancellations, because we were looking ahead of time this particular patient has a high BMI, has this, they are gonna need this medical clearance. Let's follow through with that patient to find out if they did. That team has really cut down on almost all of our um, shortages, like of anything of two or three day cancellations before. The other thing we did, because again, we have some unreliable situations where just it's demographic of where a doctor comes from, that it's really interesting that, um, and it's, it's kind of to specialty too. I'll do the same thing. Pain management seems to be a key thing. There, if the patient feels well that day, they're not showing up for the surgical procedure. <laughs> so if you know that you can do 20 on this particular day, um, we'll build, book 24 or 25 from that doctor because we're going to see an attrition rate of cancellations anticipated. Now, if all 24 or 25 show up, then you do some, you have to do a grand gesture for your staff, but at least that way, that was more cases than not. But if you know that that's going to happen in particular situations and you just let it happen in that sense, then you're getting that caseload because the overage doesn't happen that much. You get to really do know your doctors where, you know, he always loses two patients. So let's put two or three on after. Let's let's overbook them by two or three because then we'll it'll even out the day. And just that kind of situation back and forth, we're seeing that it's, it is more pertaining to particular specialties and obviously what's wrong with the patient. Um, it's also finding out ahead of time and, and again, using your staff and listening to your staff that, you know, we called this patient about this instruction. We went to do the, the nursing evaluation ahead of time. Uh, the patient doesn't really even know if they booked the surgery or not. I don't think this patient's staying on the caseload. And like going back to the office and coordinating things like that to get that through. So that's we did that based initially on our model because that suddenly opened it up that we were, the customer really did matter. It was the doctor and the doctor's, the point I've always said, you know, the doctor's our customer and the patient is the doctor's customer. Both customer experiences have to be stunning. I appreciate just how tactical you got there, Jeffrey, with some, some real real concrete stuff. Hopefully folks can take away from that. Um, thank you. I want to move now. We, so we've talked about um, uh, show rates. We've talked about numerous challenges. And we've talked about sort of collections in the sense of making it easy to for, for patients to pay. But an element of, of collections that we maybe haven't had spent uh, as much time on is sort of the challenges those conversations can prevent or present to staff. Um, so curious to get some thoughts in terms of um, what what are those challenges that the staff encounter when trying to have these financial conversations with, with teams? And I, I guess, how do you support them in, in this endeavor? 
Um, Jeffrey, do you want to take first crack yeah. at this one? I'll tell you, we actually are facing another situation here in New York. Um, our state legislature and governor just put into effect that if a patient doesn't pay, there's really not much you can do against them. You can't report them to a credit agency. You can't put them in collection. New York has gone that route. And actually, they're making it to the point that we're actually rethinking whether we're going to get that 20% copay or do we just assume we're not going to have it at all just because our legislature put teeth into this thing that really binds hospitals, surgery centers, and doctors now that they can't really seek after that collection. Um, so we look at it ahead of time to find out if it's going to be a problem for the patient. You know, Can we set up a payment plan for the patient where there's a certain amount first? Letting the patient really know what they owe is really key factor. They, there can't be any surprises after the fact. And um, specifically, we also have an, another law that we have to tell the patient seven days prior to the surgery, you know, exactly what their financial responsibility is. So we're now bound by law here in New York to do that. So in that situation, it's just trying to get them to where, how are we going to collect our fair share of what we can collect? But also we're, we're navigating the situation of, um, you know, finding out ahead of time from the patient, is it a hardship for them? Is it, will they be put on a payment plan? Different options of that care credit, uh, just any of the finances that um, patient financing things, making some of those available to patients, if that's another option. So we've kind of looked at a number of those things to kind of push through. Yeah, pro, being proactive is already important, but you throw the sort of that legislative environment on top of it, it sounds like it's just essential now. To, yeah. to get out in front of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Brian, I saw you, you, you come off mute there. Um, let's hear from you now. And then, and then Andrew, maybe we'll jump down to you. Yeah. But Jeff took it there at the end, but yes, optionality with all forms of payment, right? That that's critical. So patient financing, Jeff, um, is taking off an ortho, especially the ASC side, especially the ASC side. So buy now, pay later. We hear it all the time. Care now, pay later is what we like to call it. But that optionality, that financing um, flexibility alleviates any of the staff patient negative interactions. If we provide a patient with all forms of payment, there's really nothing to be upset about so long as they know what they're paying, right? So that optionality is key. And then my point was going to be patient payment plans, amazing. Uh, have to have them. Patients want them, need them. Take it to the next level where, hey, I, I need something even more than this. That's where patient financing could be very critical for the ASC ortho world. That, that optionality and that transparency together, it sounds like, is sort of the, the package you want. Um, Andrew, let's hear from you on this. Yeah, I think one of the things that we did that seems like it's maybe the opposite of customer service, um, but we start sending text messages out ahead of time before the visit to where they pay their bill ahead of time to the text and it takes the pressure off the staff of calling and saying, Hey, Brian, you owe money to us. Yeah. Um, go ahead and pay it. So, so it, it's, I'm, you got me excited. You got me excited. So free care card on file with card capture is taking off. It is incredibly powerful. Patients want it. Hey, I owe $500. It's one click. So yeah. kudos that that's awesome. That's really exciting. Yeah, we've done that now for about two years, and I think the the pressure from our collection staff or patient account staff, it just instru like instrumentally went down. You know, they they were like, "Oh my god, I don't have to have this awkward conversation now." That and and it's also kind of a empathetic device where you can say, "Oh yeah, that's our text message thing. I know it's a thousand dollars. Let's set up a payment plan." So sorry about that. So then you instantly get service recovery out of it too. So kind of a double double win and like you don't find those very often but our patients love it uh like brian was saying because their cards on file they don't have to worry about anything it just auto charges it after the fact now there's some people who don't like it but um they have the option to opt out of it as well so you get the best of both worlds and i will tell you in like a, a labor shortage um having that text message solution ahead of time is a game changer and in, in terms of the opt out, how how much you said some, but is it just a marginal set of folks basically? Like five percent. I mean, it's super okay. low. Thank you, Andrew. John, let's hear from you now. I I, I agree with what uh, Andrew was saying, and, and Brian and Jeff. Um, 
you know, we, we use varying degrees, all of those things. Um, we have financial counselors that talk to people that outlay the expectation, things like that. Um, I'm just dumbfounded by the state of New York and what Jeffrey is saying. Um, you know, are they doing the same for legal fees? Are they doing the same for insurance? Are they doing the same for movies? You know, you're not ever going to tell someone that you can't get paid for the good work that you do. And that's basically what they're trying to say there. And it, it that disturbs me. And I hope no one in New York has friends in Springfield, Illinois, because I certainly don't want to see that come here. Um, but, you know, what what the, the expect people people know you have to pay for medical care. You know, I think we try so hard to spare people's feelings that we let we allow front desk people to be uncomfortable with the conversation. And the best way through the best change management tool for getting people through uncomfortable situations is to normalize them and make them part of the routine. And just we have a front I can hear the front desk from my office. And this was a real problem for us. And so we brought it up. We said, look, just ask. Just find a nice, pleasant way in your voice. Here are the three points you need to make. Just ask. And I hear this one uh, front desk person, and she has been she's amazing to listen to because she just makes it. It's very much, you know, hey, here's the expectation. They're, they don't hum and haw. She just gets right through it. And the success that she's having collecting copays, collecting outstanding balances has been amazing. It's 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 a natural part of the transaction. You know, we live in a transactional world. We shouldn't be afraid to ask to be paid for the work that we do. And we, you know, and it, it and if the person says, hey, I can't do that right now, cool. Now, you know, we'll, we'll just put it on the statement. We'll put it on the bill. That's fine. And, you know, just let people know that they can do that. And I just think that we allow staff to be, staff's discomfort with asking for something that they find difficult, that we allow that and, you know, what you know, what you permit, you promote, and you know we we just need to make sure that we're uh, we're we're not permitting that, so that we're not promoting it, and we have to keep you know we have to make sure that staff knows what they need to do, without scaring them. Yeah, yeah, and John, I again analogy. I know I started with it, but I, if I took my son to the barber last night, I made an appointment. They took my card and charged me before I got there because I didn't cancel within 24 hours. So mm -hmm. this is a normal everything experience for us in retail. It's coming to healthcare. So getting that copay when it was five, ten dollars, it wasn't the end of the world. Now it's 50, 75 dollars. That adds up very, very quickly. Well, to your point, Brian, I mean, it's we we call it healthcare, but it's turning into retail care with these high deductible health plans. Like we all have to be cost conscious of what's going on because you know, when the patient makes up my largest payer in my practice, that that's retail care all of a sudden. Yes, like we don't like hearing that, but that's reality. Ooh. Like we live in these ten, twelve thousand dollar deductibles. People are on the hook, and like yeah. they're gonna shop it around, and we got to make sure we can do it. It's unfortunate when you have to tell the patient you really don't have health insurance. You might think you do, but you really yeah. don't. <laughs> well, that's that's Jeffrey. You're spot on. That's exactly what I was going to say. We don't have health insurance in this company. We have health finance in this company. You have a mechanism for healthcare finance, United, Aetna, Blue Cross, whoever, that is your financing company. And you're giving them money and you're joining their risk pool, which is the only thing that makes it insurance is because they use the language of risk. And uh, it just, it, um, it, it I, I tell that to students all the time and they look at me like, hmm? and uh, it, it's true. I mean, it's, we've created such a complicated system when it's really a very simple transaction and and you know the retailization of it actually i think is probably a good thing because it is going to force us to make fundamental changes in the way we deliver care that'll truly drive costs down and make us more uh more more um price sensitive and cost sensitive sort of a, a, a spirited back and forth there uh you know i make my job very easy for this final stretch of, uh, of our of our panel discussion here thank you so much everyone but we are coming up against time so i do want to ask the final question which is if attendees remember just one thing from our conversation what should it be and this could be something you're re-emphasizing or something new that we didn't get to or cover in our in our conversation today um andrew i'm gonna give you first crack at this yeah i think for from my kind of nugget that i would drop to you know, remember for people is, you know, just do the right thing and, and bracket it around that kiss idea. 
Um, Cause what we want as consumers with everything else in our lives is what patients want with us. So just make it easy. And if you bring that mindset, you would know what the right thing is. Like what would you want in their shoes, right? Yeah, I want access. I want a way to pay my bill that's reasonable, that fits my terms, and I want to make it convenient for me. Yep. Thank you, Andrew. Jeffrey, go ahead. Definitely technology. The easier you make it for them, the better chance you have of actually collecting. That's really, it's down to that. Thank you, Jeffrey. John, what do you got? I would say that, you know, the only constant is change. That's an old saying, but it's true. And that what worked two years ago isn't going to work in two years from now and that we have to be open to that type of change and if we're not lean if if, if if we're not willing to jump into the pool wading into the pool is going to put us at a disadvantage we have to be willing to embrace innovation change technology different ways of doing things and we have to look at different industries for ins inspiration for how we can better address some of this consumer nature thank you so much john brian yeah, it's going to go down that road as well. So don't be afraid of it. Uh, technology is here. Uh, your patients want it. Your patients need it. And the staff in uh, clinics need it. Uh, think about what happened over the last 30 days. Things like card on file or text to pay is mission critical to keep cash flow coming through. So leverage the technology you have at your fingertips. It is, it is important. Like Andrew said, patient payment, patient out of pocket is skyrocketing. The more technology we have, there's going to be a bigger ROI for the C-suites like yourselves uh, before it makes the staff and user experience even better. So use it, try it, get it, uh, and go out and access it is my, is my advice. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, John. It, it really was a pleasure having this conversation with you all today. Really, truly appreciate you taking your time. Uh, also, of course, want to thank Reich Tegel Health for, for sponsoring today's webinar, helping us help helping us put this together. To learn more about the conversation we had today, you can check out the resources section on your webinar console and fill out the post-webinar survey. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.